We continue our discussion of probability here by reminding you that sometimes in mathematics it's, it's much easier to solve a problem if you can restate it in a different way. For example, if I ask you to calculate the probability of an event E, but that calculation turns out to be complicated, sometimes it might be easier to calculate the probability of E complement, in other words, the probability that E does not occur, because you know that the probability of E is just 1 minus the probability of E complement. And if you think about it that way, that the probability of an event is 1 minus the probability of its complement, the probability that an event occurs is 1 minus the probability that it doesn't occur, then sometimes a problem that looks relatively complicated is much easier to solve. If you want to look at that graphically, if you think of the probability of an event E as being contained in the interior of that circle, then the, the probability that it doesn't occur is the rest of the sample space, which is represented by the rectangle. Let's take an example of that. Suppose I give you this chart about a group of voters' party affiliation. And let's say the event E that we're going to calculate the probability of is the event that the person has a party affiliation. And we want to find out that probability. This pie chart shows us the percent of voters by party affiliation. But keep in mind that we're dealing with probabilities, so we need to convert those percents to decimals. That 7.2 means 7.2% and 23.7%. All these numbers are percents. So, so to change them to the decimal, you move the decimal point two places to the left. So first things first, you need to go ahead and get that done. Once you do that, you can see that the probability that a person has a party affiliation is just the probability that that person's a Democrat plus the probability that that person's a Republican plus the probability that that person is a Green Party or a Libertarian Party member or some other party not listed explicitly. And I can do it that way. I can look and see that the probability that a person's a Democrat is 0.371, the probability that they're a Republican is 0.241, the probability that they're Green Party is 0.044, the probability that they're Libertarian is 0.035, and the probability that some other party is 0.072. And if I add up all those numbers, I'll find out that the probability that the person has a party affiliation is 0.763, or about 76.3%. But that's really the hard way to do it. It's much easier to use the result by the complement. The complement rule says if the probability of E is what you're trying to calculate, you can calculate it as 1 minus the probability of E complement. In other words, the probability that the person has a party affiliation is 1 minus the probability that that person does not have a party affiliation. The people that don't have a party affiliation are in this orange area of the pie graph. And I know that that is 0.237. So the probability that a person has a party affiliation is simply the 1 minus probability that there is none. And that number is 0.237. So if you say 1 minus 0.237, you get 0.763. But those, those two numbers are the same. In other words, you got the same thing both ways. Well, which way was faster? Which way was easier? Obviously, using the result about complements is much easier. So that's what I mean by saying sometimes using the fact that the probability of event is 1 minus the probability of the complement of that event is really the best way to do a problem. We also have something called the union rule for probabilities. You should remember back with sets we had a, a result called the union rule for sets. The union rule for probabilities is exactly of the same form as that. Instead of accounting number of, though, we're talking about probabilities. But otherwise, if you look back at the union rule for sets, it's exactly the same result, except the capital P replaces the small n. What the union rule for probability says is that the probability of the union of two events is the probability of the first event occurring plus the probability of the second event occurring minus the probability of the intersection of the two events. That's the union rule for probabilities. It's easy to see why the union rule for probability is written the way it is if you construct a Venn diagram. Notice that the probability of E union F 
is the area included in either or both circles. In other words, if I actually do some cross hatching, the probability of E union F is that cross hatch region. It's the region that's in either or both circles. And so if you just com compute the probability of E, you're getting the part that's in the blue circle. If you do the probability of F, you're getting the part that's in the reddish colored circle. But what's happened is you've, you've taken the overlap and counted it twice. So this overlapping region, which is the region where E and F intersect, has gotten counted twice. It got counted as a part of circle E, but it also got counted as a part of circle F. So that's why you have to subtract off one of them. You've counted it twice, so you've got to subtract one occurrence back off again. So just a visual way of seeing why the union rule for probabilities has to be what it is. Take this and do an example. Suppose we select a single card from a standard 52 card deck and want to know what the probability is that we draw either a heart or a face card. Now you do have to remember what a deck of cards looks like, but we want to find the probability that we get a heart or a face card. So I'm going to let the event H be the event that we draw a heart, and I'll let the event F be the event that we draw a face card. And if we write it that way, the probability that we draw either a heart or a face card is just the probability of H union F. The standard deck of cards, remember, it refers to hearts, has 13 of each suit, so in particular it has 13 hearts. So if I want to look at the probability of H union F as being made up of the probability of it being a heart, plus the probability of it being a face card, and then I have to subtract off the intersection because it, count, it got counted twice, then I can go through, and since there are 13 hearts out of 52 cards in the deck, the probability of getting a heart is 13 over 52. Remember, there are 12 face cards. Those are the cards with faces. There are 12 of them. So the probability of getting a face card is 12 over 52. But you can, can see we've counted some of these cards twice. The queen, jack, and king of hearts got counted as a face card, but also got counted as a heart. There are three of those out of 52, so you have to subtract that off because it got, they got counted twice. So you end up with 13 plus 12 minus 3 all over 52. And that comes out to 22 over 52, and that reduces to 1126. So by the union rule of probabilities, the probability of getting a heart or a face card is 11 out of 26. And the basic idea is here, if you calculate the probability of getting a heart, and then you calculate the probability of getting a face card and add them together, you've not gotten the right answer yet because you've counted the overlapping cards twice, and that's why you have to subtract off the probability of those overlapping cards. And that's how you end up with 1126. Before we go away from this, I want to make one special comment about that formula, union rule for probabilities, and that is if the two events are mutually exclusive, they don't really, there's really no overlap, then the probability of overlap, which is the E, the probability of E intersect F, is just zero. So there's really nothing to subtract off. So the point I'm making is the union rule for probability, which has this term that's subtracted, that term goes away if you know that E and F are mutually exclusive. So if you know there's no overlap, there's nothing to subtract. So all I'm saying is you can dispense with subtracting anything if you happen to know that the two events are mutually exclusive. In general you don't, but if you do, the formula is much simpler. Let's actually 
do an application problem now. Suppose we have a survey of consumers that shows the amount of time they spend shopping online each month compared to their annual income. And that's what you see in this chart. Let T be the event that the consumer spends 10 or more hours per month shopping online. And let A be the event that the consumer has an annual income above 60000 The question is, what is the probability that a randomly selected consumer neither shops online 10 or more hours a month, nor has an annual income above 60000 So we want to know the probability of that happening, that they neither shop online 10 or more hours a month, nor do they have an annual income above 60000 If you don't get anything else from this, I hope that you will at least learn that a lot of times you can solve these probability problems without having to formally use a formula if you just think about what you're being asked. If you go back to the original problem in the chart, they're asking about the consumers that don't shop online 10 or more hours per month. That's the list of values in that blue box because they don't shop online 10 or more hours per month. So that would be the 3 to 9 hours or the 0 to 2 hours. Those are the consumers that don't shop online 10 or more hours per month. But we also want those that also don't have an annual income above 60000 That's the red box. That's the six numbers inside of this red box because their income is below 60000 So we want to know the probability that a randomly selected consumer does neither. In other words, we're looking for the consumers that don't shop online 10 hours or more per month, nor do they have an annual income of 60000 And when you think about it, that's just the intersection of the blue box numbers with the red box numbers, and I've highlighted those in yellow. So they're just asking us the probability of being in the yellow area. And that's easy. So the probability that the consumer doesn't shop 10 hours or more a month online, nor does a, that consumer have an income above 60000 is simply the sum of the numbers in the yellow box over the grand total of consumers surveyed, which is 1600 And if you add the numbers in the numerator, you get 816 divided by 1600 And if you write that as a decimal, you get 0 0.51 or 51%. So the probability that a consumer doesn't shop 10 hours or more per month online, nor do they have an income above 60000 is just a little over 50%, 0 0.51 in particular.